on my uh, very, I know all these people, but anyway, there we are. On my very far right, it's a great pleasure to welcome Francis Valentine, who is the founder of Tech um, Futures Lab New Zealand, uh, very much in the forefront of um, all the upskilling of people around these issues. Next to her, Ian Taylor, um, our, our great digital leader in New Zealand, the war stories he could tell you over the last 30 years, uh, founder and chief executive of animation research in New Zealand. Um, next to um, Ian Lee Flounders, who's a board member of NZ Tech, um, obviously the Industry Association for Tech Companies and also a non-executive director of Vigilance New Zealand. Um, next to uh, Lee, we have uh, Vic Crone, who's chief executive of Callahan Innovation. For the, uh, those of you from overseas, Callahan is a large... Uh, central organization, key organization uh, in the government on technology, both in terms of some strategizing and some uh, funding and other sorts of help. Next to Vic is um, Caroline Tremaine, who's chief executive of um, the Ministry of Business, um, Innovation and Employment in New Zealand, which is kind of the ministry of almost everything economically. Uh, a very powerful person in the land. And it's my very great pleasure not that it wasn't to introduce the rest of you, <laughs> to uh, introduce um, um, Alderman um, uh, Charles Bowman, um, who has flown all the way from London, uh, where he is the 690th Lord Mayor of London. So any of you politicians in the room can understand there are systems that do last a long time, um, but a rather peculiar one, I'd have to say, about the City of London. Uh, but Charles is here with a business delegation, um, to uh, not only participate in this conference, um, but um, to do lots of good business too. So thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to start um, in our normal fashion of five minutes each. We've got a countdown clock here. So, uh, Francis, it's up to you. Thank Go you. for it. Kia ora, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm in a very privileged position. I get to spend a lot of time with a very diverse group of people from thousands of students, teachers, and businesses from executives and boards. And it's given me a unique perspective about where the world is, both here and globally. So I want to actually just start by challenging the topic that we have here, um, which is supporting a thriving digital sector. My view of the world is it probably could be changed into actually just getting out of the way to create a thriving digital sector. Because I have great faith that there is a generation coming up right behind us all that's going to change things significantly. And maybe to example, provide uh, some context to this, I want you just to imagine that you're coming on a picnic with me. But I can only take 100 people from around the world, and I need to actually shrink the world down to 100 people. If there was 100 people on this digital picnic, half of them roughly will come from Asia. And of that, about half that group will also be under the age of 30, or a third will be under the age of 20. <laughs> getting really old. <laughs> but actually, even more interesting when you get to that, only 15% will be over the age of 55. So I start to think about the world and who makes decisions right now. We imagine it from a Western point of view. We imagine the developed nation point of view, the aging population. And what we miss if we don't go to the macro view of the world is why is technology changing so quickly? And Graham said this morning, I thought it was very really pertinent, that he said you know, the most, or some of the least democratic countries in the world are um, chasing technology the fastest. And they have to. If you have a population of over a billion people in your nation and they're very young, how are you going to educate them? How are you going to feed them, provide them health services? How are you going to provide the economic stability for your nation? So the changes that we're mostly seeing today are not driven by the Western world but by burgeoning large populations of young and developing nations. And if you just talk to anyone in China about WeChat and life before WeChat, out of nowhere comes a technology platform that completely changes the world. Or in India, the new payment systems. So what it is like, it's imagine like now come back to New Zealand. You're driving down the road, you're heading to an intersection and the traffic lights are out. And that moment when we panic, it's like, can I remember the old road rules to navigate through this intersection without crashing? And that's what a young person looks at the world through these eyes of someone saying, why would you do it this way, the old way? It doesn't make sense. So we have to keep framing our point of view from those who really matters, 
who have figured out faster, better, more efficient ways of doing things, which is more democratic. It is more egalitarian. It's more about fairness. And so I want everybody to, through this whole session again tomorrow, to be thinking about those young people who are actually shaping the world because they can. And so for me, it's a really important time to be thinking about the digital and the framework of the entire planet and not lose sight of the developing versus developed. And I think at that point, we'll start to see the impact and change that we're about to experience, because I would bet money that the next five years will be the most innovative of the history of this planet. As the computer processing capacity and the access to the internet and our super fast smartphones will give access to education and knowledge that we've never seen before. We already know that over half of the STEM graduates on this planet, so STEM being science, technology, engineering, and maths, come from the BRICS nations, the Brazils, the Indonesia, the India, the China, the South Africa, and I've missed one. <laughs> Russia, thank you. <laughs> By 2030, it will increase to 75% of the graduates who are STEM graduates will come from those same nations. We have a long way to go. We have plenty of intelligence and research and data to tell us where the world is going, but we can no longer keep on the, the, so the, the uh, framework of risk. There isn't a roadmap for this. The only people who will navigate through this change going forward will be those who take away the risk profile and say, I'm embracing change and I'm going to make it happen. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Francis. Um, Ian. Komoha ka te awa, ka haururu, te maunga, ka ngati pahuere, te hapu, ka ngati kāmuni, te iwi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And for those of you who don't listen to Guy and Esper in the mornings, that just <laughs> means I'm a simple little Māori fella from a little place called Hawke's Bay, Rauponga. <laughs> and, and the other thing which is really important is I know nothing about technology at all. So the reason I'm here is because at a very early age, I surrounded myself with really clever white people. That's how I got to here. So... You see, I've got a question. Because I don't know anything, I've just got a series of questions here. And my first question, with all due respect to, to Alex, why would we choose a Nike slogan, let's just do it, from a company that made its money from low-value labour? I mean, is that what we're doing here today to discuss the digital nations? Digital nations' top priority should be creating high-value jobs for our young people. There is no other option. So I prefer this one. It's the one we use, but it's a real Kiwi one. Bugger the boxing, pour the concrete anyway. Now, <laughs> now, no, you see, it's not that frivolous because here's the lesson we take from bugger the boxing, pour the concrete anyway. The first thing is that you have to trust everyone around you. If you're going to go pouring concrete without boxing, trust is absolutely the ultimate th um, thing you need with your staff. That's the first one. And the second one, relates to what we're talking about here today, you have to also believe that somewhere, someone is spending billions of dollars trying to design technology that will allow you to pour concrete without boxing. And that, I think, is a much better slogan for New Zealand than just do it. Bugger the boxing, pour the concrete anyway. So it means that you look at the world in a different way. So the Māori worldview, let's take that. In the Māori worldview, it's the footsteps we lay down in our past that create the paving stones of where we stand today. And here's the real cux of that. Those footsteps are always in front of you. Your past always lies in front of you. And you know, as we start to reflect on what this nation's going to be, it's a hell of a, hell of a way to view the world. Because I look out there and I see myself as a seven-year-old in a little house in Rauponga watching the man with the from the electric power board attach electricity to our house to bring electricity for the first time. I was seven. It was 1957. And it's an unbroken path to the place I stand today where I use, am using my phone to track the Volvo Ocean Yacht Race around the world in real time using software written by these clever white people down in Dunedin. So it's an unbroken line. It makes the future really easy to understand. Now, there's another slogan that I, I'm just not a fan of. Fail fast. I'm going to be really... Um, this might sound arrogant, but I've been in this digital business for 30 years, and probably because I've surrounded myself with clever white people, we've never failed once. Not once. Why? 
Would you set out on a goal with this idea that, oh, let's just fail fast? Why not look at the idea, go, you know what? That's a bloody good idea. Whatever it takes, let's make it happen. And yeah, we've gone down paths and found, oh, doesn't work that way, so let's turn. Let's divert. Let's do this. But failure is actually not an option. Pick good ideas, believe in them, and then take that journey down. So that's kind of how we work. Um, just getting back to this Māori worldview, um, the other thing about it is this, there's been talk about social return on investment. So if we talk about how this digital nation making a difference to our people, let me share this one with you. And this, you know, I'm, I really love this as a new model for the way we fund R&D. So we came up, somebody came to us and said, numeracy and literacy in prisons, could we use 360 VR to teach that? So you don't see why not. So we're developing a 360 VR, really interesting. We took this down to the prison. We've, we actually designed a thing that has the prisoners outside on a garage and they have to read signs on the door and do all this sort of stuff to get the door open using 360 VR. Engagement was ultimate. That guy put it on, he goes, looks like this. He goes, hey, bro, we're out. I mean, <laughs> the, engagement, the engagement is enormous. But here's the thing. We went to see, this is going to make a difference. This is technology that will make a difference. So we went out, how do we fund this? Well, there was no way to fund it. So I'm at my iwi in Hastings, talking at the Dragons and Tanifa Conference, and I mentioned this. My iwi steps up and says, that makes a difference to our people. That will be really important. Let's just go and do it. So we have gone to the government. We've said to the government, actually, we're going to fund this. It's really important. It will make a difference. You're welcome to come if you want to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, uh, Lee, sorry. <laughs> thank you. It's Lee. And, um, you know, I set myself a goal about three years ago to always be the least intelligent person on a panel. And um, today is no exception. So thank you so much and very eloquent. Um, I'm also the only person today who's wearing a T-shirt. So um, rather, than a, <laughs> rather than a shirt. So either I'm very, um, you know, very shabby or from the tech sector. So I'd like to, um, do you know what? Uh, yesterday I was thinking about preparing this and tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking for around about half an hour, so I have a lot of content to talk about. But I thought today I'd take the approach of actually listening to some of the common themes that have come from today and reflect on them now as well. And there's two key points that have really jumped out that are um, very dear to my heart at the moment, um, and that is around youth um, and also the the scale and velocity, the pace of change at present. And these two things are very relevant to me at the moment, um, primarily because I spent only one week in January here in Auckland. I was incredibly lucky enough to spend some time in Thailand and then spend some time working in Switzerland and then also incredibly lucky to spend some time in Hamilton. And, and only, having, only having a week here in Auckland uh, gave me an opportunity to actually look at uh, my children. Uh, and two things happened that, that really, really disturbed me. Um, firstly, in that time, my son, who's 10 years old, managed to uh, hop on YouTube, buy himself a Rubik's Cube, uh, teach himself, well, firstly, understand what an algorithm is, uh, teach himself how to use an algorithm, uh, and then solve the Rubik's Cube. And he was very proud of himself when I arrived back from Switzerland about that. Um, I didn't even care about the chocolates and Toblerone that I'd bought him. And um, th that, that first and foremost uh, really stood out because I can't actually do a Rubik's Cube. Um, secondly, my daughter, who's eight years old, um, so just some context, I love video games, um, in particular first-person shooters. I don't know if anyone's ever played Battlefield 2. Um, in fact, I started playing first-person shooters when I was um, about 16. Uh, and something really horrific happened when I came home, is uh, my daughter, who's eight, uh, bet me um, at a first-person shooter. So what it, uh, just sort of context of this, is while I was away gallivanting um, Switzerland, 
Thailand and um, and Hamilton. Um, my children were uh, scaling up digitally. They were uh, we, they were learning digitally. They were playing video games. They were um, moving at such a pace that was faster than what I could have ever imagined. Uh, but there's a parallel there. There's youth and there's speed. And then at the same time, while I was in particular in Switzerland at a blockchain convention, what I noticed was the sheer scale, the speed, the velocity that a market, blockchain, cryptocurrency, an industry was evolving. And there was a lot of young people there as well. In fact, um, I've never seen such a diverse group of people at this event in San Moritz. It was terrible, the skiing was horrific. I've got some great videos that I just can't show my wife because the skiing was just that good. But the reality was there was young, there was old, and they were creating this industry that was moving so fast. There was regulators, there was monetary authorities, there was government, there was startups, there was incumbents, all moving rapidly. And then coming back to New Zealand, almost a reverse parallel of what are we doing here in New Zealand? What are we missing here for this industry that's moving so fast? And anyone who's been involved in blockchain or certainly um, what we call ICOs or initial coin offerings will understand that there is a truck load of cash about and it's all being injected into that industry at the moment. So just as I was away and missing out as my children are moving fast and become digital adopters and beating me at video games, I just can draw a parallel here in New Zealand as to what are we missing out as this industry evolves and how are we doing as a government, as a culture, as incumbents, what are we doing to be able to capitalise on this massive change that's happening right now? Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Lee. Um, in many ways, you're throwing the question straight to Vic because she runs an organisation that's very involved in that question. So, Vic, all yours. Thank you. And, do you know, I always knew there was something that I was doing wrong when I was laying concrete paths. <laughs> so, th <laughs> thanks for that tip. Yeah, I think I'll stick to chopping trees down. Um, I, I guess I wanted to kick off by basically saying, you know, this is Digital Nations 2030. And for me, that undercooks um, where we should already be. We should be a digital nation now. Uh, most of our society, many of our people uh, have access to digital technologies now. Uh, so my perspective is that everything is already digital. And it actually comes down to how we, the different parts of our society, whether it's government, business, social enterprise, are embracing digital or not. I would hate to think it will take us another 12 years to reach the state of a, um, of a digital nation. So for me, the first thing is mindset. Everything should already be digital. And if you're not in digital now, then you've got not a lot of shot at getting through the next decade uh, and surviving that next decade. So what does that mean? That means if, if you're not across it, you need to learn it and you need to proactively get out there and learn about these new technologies coming through. You need to embrace them. Uh, and you need to be seriously, seriously comfortable with change. Life will, um, as um, Francis alluded to, uh, life is going to be um, one of the, f well, the next five years are going to be one of the fastest changes we've ever seen. And if you're uncomfortable with change, um, then that is going to be problematic. So let's do some testing of indeed how, um, how much we do understand and learn these new technologies. So hands up, who owns a 3D printer? Well, that's pretty sad, isn't it? Okay, who owns a robot vacuum cleaner? Okay, that's not much better. Who's got a robot lawnmower? Okay, so you really do need one of those. Uh, who's got an electric car? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I want one of these, so if you don't have one, I understand it. Who's got a robot clothes um, cleaner? You know, you put your clothes in that thing, it washes them all and then um, irons them and spits them out, out the other side. Anyone got one of those? No? Okay, no one's trying that. Drones? Who's got drones? Who's playing with drones? Good. Maybe because that's a bit more techie boy -y. Um And who's in the sharing economy? Who shares a house or a batch? Who shares a car? Anything? Do you share anything? A lawnmower? 
<laughs> I mean, and this is such a good example. These are the things that are going to be hitting us, and we are leaders, whether that's in our country or our business or our industry. And if you're not playing with these technologies, then you can't possibly hope to understand how do you then take those technologies and apply them, not just to your business in terms of products and services or value change or manufacturing processes, or in terms of government, in terms of how these technologies can help our citizens and us provide better services. So I guess one of the big things I would say is get these technologies into your home, into your workplace, and start, um, start playing with them and start trying them. And if you don't want them, at least get them into the hands of young people who will want to play with them and who will pass that on to you. So for me, everyone, everything will be impacted by digital over the next decade. Our business, government, um, our jobs. Um, and I guess my biggest concern is that we commentate uh, on all of these digital technologies coming through without actually understanding them. And we had an interesting panel I was on with Rod a couple of years ago uh, in terms of um, the future of transport. And you know, when I was talking then about driverless vehicles, people thought I was mad. This was literally two years ago. Um, but we're now starting to see the applications of driverless vehicles. And if we put a curiosity mindset on technology coming through, not a judgment mindset on things that we don't understand. I look at my parents, um, 81, 82, and 74, you know, in five years' time, driverless will be absolutely perfect for them. I look at people who cannot drive now and have no mobility because of um, seeing issues, perfect application for them. Um, I look at um, busy mums who need to get their kids around, beautiful application for them. So understanding those applications and how they help our society, not just business, is important. But if you're not playing with this technology, you can't understand it. Um, uh, the next one is that uh, Francis alluded to this, and I firmly believe in it. We are facing new competitors as countries. Um, developing countries are accelerating at a rate of knots. They are growing up with social cloud and mobility uh, in a way that we never did. Uh, and so their ability to develop new products and services for this new world that we are entering into is actually much stronger than ours. Uh, I believe, I'm a big believer that in 10 years' time, if you look ahead, uh, the role of our people will be how uh, their ability to match artificial intelligence and what's coming out from sensors, big data, and all of that, and put our um, creativity, our judgment, our complex scenario planning, and our empathy over that. So that idea of a, a collective intelligence workforce is exactly where I think we're heading. For me, technology is just the start, though, because it's the change that it drives. Our, our business models are changing, and government platform as a service uh, is coming our way as well. If you're not part of a platform, either in business or government, you are going to be irrelevant over the next five to seven years. You might have 10 maximum. Uh, in terms of our role as leaders, that is changing under our feet. You look at the movement like Me Too, um, there's so many others where you are unable to say things that you were able to say five years ago as leaders. And you better get on that, on that bus and move fast because the opportunity to be caught out um, is huge. And of course our jobs, with up to 50% of our jobs transitioning. So where are those jobs gonna go? Uh, apart from two robots and then our roles will actually shift I actually think the emergence of social enterprise is a place where a lot of our people will go to. And in our country, anyway, we need a lot more conversation around that. So for me, moving forwards, um, science, industry, working together uh, is exciting. And get out there and buy some robot vacuum cleaners. Crikey. <laughs> if you're a niece. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I'm sure you know that the uh, companies that sell the robot vacuum cleaners are selling the data on your house to all sorts of people who can then work out you don't have a SETI and you need one. I mean, it's <laughs> jolly scary. <laughs> anyway, so I digress. Does Sorry, uh, <laughs> Carolyn, it's all yours. Thanks. Thank you. Um, look, I was uh, just listening as Lee was uh, talking and um, we had a number of birthdays occur over the January period as well. But um, my eight-year-old nephew uh, arrived with his birthday present, which was um, just uh, a, a little flash drive, and he said... I coded you a game. And I thought to myself, actually, that's the difference between um, the newer generation coming through. He has no expectation that a uh, gift is actually a physical thing. It's something for enjoyment. It's something to actually get out there. But it's using skills that he's learning at school now. And I guess um, what I've taken from today, and particularly as I've listened to my uh, fellow panel members, is that actually the digital world is here. Um, that we have a very vibrant digital economy in New Zealand, 
and uh, somebody has to count things, and that's often left to government to do. So MB, being um, in charge of almost everything in New Zealand, but not quite everything in New Zealand, um, definitely looks at what's happening in the economy and the digital economy. So we have about 28,000 companies working um, in this part of the economy who contribute overall uh, just over $16 billion of GDP. In fact, the third largest contributor to GDP, which uh, for a relatively small uh, country, quite astonishing. And we're ambitious and we want to see us go to um, being the second largest contributor to, to GDP. And I think one of the things that's really accelerated some of that is not just the mindset, and I think there are parts of our um, country that obviously have that mindset, and I'm going to remember the concrete boxing, but um, I'm not going to tell my husband about that one, <laughs> just in case. Um, so ultra-fast broadband, um, the government's invested $1.5 billion in that program of work. We're about three quarters of the way through implementation of that. By 2022, we would expect that communities of um, around 100 people anywhere in New Zealand would have access to ultra-fast broadband. And that's going to matter because, as we heard earlier in the day, uh, the infrastructure matters. Having the infrastructure available for people is about connectivity, connectivity not just domestically, but of course internationally. I think one of the things that uh, the Minister touched on um, in her address was very much about wanting to see a thriving economy, a thriving digital economy for New Zealand. And what that means is uh, an economy that's driven by concepts that improve both productivity but also social outcomes. And she talked about people within our communities being left behind and what we need to do through the digital programs of work is actually enable those communities to participate fully in our, in our economy. It'll be good for the individuals, but it's also good for New Zealand. I think in terms of um, measurement, um, measurements are actually quite a task within this area, and Liz and the panel before us talked a bit about how they're thinking about data, openness of data, but equally how we actually collect data or source data, as I think Liz was talking about. And certainly within MB, we're looking at how do we actually measure things like social inclusion not just access, but ease of access. Who are those parts of the community who are not accessing our um, opportunities in the digital economy? And how can we actually reach people? I mean, I love the example uh, you gave, um, Vic, about your parents having autonomous vehicles. There are parts of our community for whom this is going to be a huge opportunity. So I guess um, from a government perspective, we'd like to think that we're ambitious for New Zealand, but this sector in particular, I think, has um, a level of ambition that we need for New Zealand for the future. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Carolyn. And Charles, it's a great pleasure to have you here um, speaking with a lot of history uh, about uh, for the City of London, which has massively reinvented itself uh, down through um, the generations and the revolutions. So over to you. Rod, well, thank you very much indeed. And I should start, ladies and gentlemen, just to say how thrilled and excited I, and indeed my entire delegation, are to be in your wonderful and very, very beautiful country. Uh, and thank you for giving us such a warm welcoming uh, reception uh, yesterday evening. Thrilled to be here. Well, it is exactly 14 weeks and three days since I became the 690th Lord Mayor of our great city of London. And I underline 690. And in that role, uh, not to be confused with uh, the Mayor of London, I act as a principal ambassador and key spokesperson for and on behalf of UK financial and related professional services. In fact, we've had a role as a Mayor of London, Mayor of the City of London, for more than 800 years. And during that time, the role has played witness to major changes, both in the London and indeed our global ecosystem. And I think we can all respect now that we are absolutely in the midst of another revolutionary change as technology begins uh, to dominate the way we all do business. Um, embracing technological innovation is absolutely fundamental 
to the success of each, each and every business. And as Lord Mayor of the City of London, which uh, homes probably the world-leading fintech sector for which we've in invested significantly and strategically over the last 10, if not 15 years, I'm certainly working to ensure that the UK, indeed, in partnership with other nations such as your own, is building an attractive digital uh, and financial ecosystem that will harness the benefits uh, and help manage the risks too. And in my view, um, there will, or this will require three things. Strong technological education, a supportive government, and a new global regulatory framework. If I take the first of those, we do need a long-term vision for building, as I often call it, a deep pool of talent and capability and that is for the future of financial and professional services. And that includes working with uh, universities and indeed in industry. And if I look to London, one of the reasons why we have got that fantastic pool and that we've been able to build this world leading fintech sector, which employs now over 45,000 people uh, in London and contributes nearly seven billion pounds to our economy, it is exactly for that reason, a strong, educational framework. Secondly, uh, a thriving fintech to, to, uh, environment does need the support and commitment from government. And I'm delighted to say that from 2008, UK government has played a critical role, whether that's in uh, the development of national cyber security centers or much more. And that support continues, not least by way of example, UK government is supporting the upcoming fintech week we're having and holding in London in March. And I would be delighted, thrilled to invite as many Kiwi companies here as po uh, there as possible. And finally, um, finally, a ma major new challenge uh, presented by the evolution of financial services will be the creation of a new global framework, the way uh, financial transactions are transacted across the globe, whether that is in here, uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, or Oxford in the UK. These are transcending boundaries, and we need to step up with a global rethink about regulation. And I'm delighted to, to say that in, that in that respect, London is paving the way, not least through the FCA's most recent announcement, uh, we're now consulting uh, on the creation of a global sandbox for companies to test out their products before uh, they fully launch to the market. A great innovation and a great product coming there too. So these three steps, but I'm also taken, and it builds off my own Merrill theme. In this new environment, we need to be very, very conscious uh, of maintaining the critical link of trust between business and society as technology develops. And I've been listening to that word develop through the course of time. So whilst I believe that tech technology is part of the issue in, in, the, uh, in the decline in trust, it has to be a solution, and we need to find ways in which new business, uh, and the fintech sector in particular, can uh, innovate uh, and develop uh, the new paradigm of, of, of trust. So education, government support, new global regulatory frameworks through the lens of trust. Better business trusted by society. Five seconds. <laughs> A precision landing almost as good at City of London Airport, you know, <laughs> through <laughs> difficult, <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for all your um, wonderful contributions to that. Um, in the f spirit of uh, this uh, session about um, supporting a thriving digitized economy, I've slightly changed the words to be more inclusive, um, let's just deal with some questions which are coming through about um, the dangers about who's going to be left behind. So here's a question. So, is the inequality gap going to be based on the age gap uh, or, on the uh, or on the education gap? Who's most at risk? Um, Ian. Yeah, so, I, I think that's really re a relevant question because my, my big question is, when I look out at this past that I watch all these footsteps, I cannot count the number of conferences like this that I've been to. And I ask myself, you know, where does the difference come? What difference will we have made in a year's time? There are no young people on these panels, and yet it's them we're talking about. And that digital, that, and I just hope you do so. I mean, we put them out the back so we can go and talk to them while we're having a cup of tea. 
They should be up here. So that's the first thing. And, you know, we can't talk about a digital nation, a successful digital nation, or a successful economy while we see our young people struggling to find jobs, struggling to get the education that they need to have these high-value jobs. So at the heart of everything, if we want to simplify this, a digital nation is one that really focuses on how it uses technology to create high-value jobs for all of its young people, and value isn't just the money you pay them. Uh, Francis. Actually, I'd like to add to that too. I wanted to go to what Christine said earlier today. She said that most people walk through the front door of their workplace and they go back a few years. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> you're a student. Yeah. Just step into their shoes and think about what they walk through the front door and see. And I think that's... So actually what I'm seeing more and more is self-educating students yeah. who go to school, they, they're collaborating, they use technology to integrate and learn, but actually a lot of what they're learning is actually self-taught. I have very little concern about what they're doing. I think the gap at the other end, the older market, who for many people I've heard is this idea, I'm just going to ride this out. I'll just get to retirement. You know, I'll just get to my pension. Mm -hmm. Actually, and, and the point again this morning raised by Graham, we're going to live to be so much... Older. And in fact, I heard a remarkable stat this week, which was that every day, the average life expectancy of a human on this planet increases by nine hours. Yeah. Every day. So I back and double check this fact, and this is where we're at right now. So we are going to live to be so much older. So I think the gap is going to be those who turn their back and say, I'm going to write it out. And actually, the young people that have started out in my talk to this afternoon was, we need to get out of the way of them. We, we don't want to put them into a box and put frameworks and parameters around them which we think are going to help. We need to listen to them. We need to actually step aside and let them step forward and let them help define the future they want to create. And part of it will be around qualifications, is actually don't measure them all in one very standardised way that has perhaps had its use by date. And look at some of the credentials, and as Sue said earlier today, we need to look at how do we know how good someone is if we're only testing them in one way. I have, great, I have great confidence in our young people, and they will, yeah. they will do this anyway. And if I give you one example, the head, of our, the head of innovation and technology in our company that has won international awards and Emmy is driven by a young guy who didn't get NCEA 3. So, yeah. you know, I have great faith in that. Um, and, and what hope would you offer anybody over, say, the age of 50? Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> what... I, I say that because Ian and I, and I, I assume that we know uh, we're, we're the same age, uh, the oldest people on the panel. So what, what, um, what hope do you offer, offer the people over 50, and what do they need to bring to that um, so that they have a well, future in this? I'm 67. I'm surrounded by young people who just keep you going. I mean, I don't think age has got anything to do with it. Okay. I would, um, I, I would just add to that, um, and you can actually bottle that and having had uh, a team of uh, incredibly young, a predominantly female, actually, mm -hmm. uh, tech team for a, a business that I was chief executive of, um, they actually transformed our business. And I would say that you can bottle that, what can an older person bring to the table? It's actually respect, and it's respect for those young people yeah. and their knowledge and their intelligence. And just like my son being able to do a Rubik's Cube that I can't do, recognising that they have unique skills, not better, not worse, but unique skills that perhaps you as an older person don't have. Exactly. Um, and the, okay. third, yeah. uh, the third gap identified uh, in a different question um, is a gender one. Um, the data that we have here in New Zealand that only 3% of 15-year-old New Zealand schoolgirls consider a career in tech while women make only up 23% of those employed in tech-related occupations. Um, so how do we turn that around so we can draw on their considerable and in some ways perhaps rather different um, skills than um, blokes have? So if I can look at uh, this particular question, because it's very much my area, is the 15-year-olds have gone through an analog school system. So it has led them to the same path that we went through. A 12-year-old has fundamentally gone through a, an inquiry-based digital education system. So we still have a transitional group. I think the under-12s have a very different outlook about gender roles and what technology brings. Technology for most young people under 12 is my electricity. It's just part of life. But the sooner you've, if you've gone from extra years to a traditional legacy and analogue school system, the more likely you are to go to gender-based roles. And so you've seen that there's global research that will show that very clearly there's a divide happening 
younger, much more open to all sorts of jobs, yeah. older, back to gender-based. So I think we've just got to ride through this one. Yeah, yeah and I think don't, underestim um, don't underestimate the importance of the parental role in this. So many parents are still advising, my daughter's 17, yeah. so many parents are still advising their kids to be doctors and lawyers yeah. uh, for the future. Those roles are going to be fundamentally different and, and they won't be the careers that they have been over the past 50 years. Yeah. Um, so as a parent, you have an obligation to ensure that your children are fit for the future world. You're not setting them up to live in a world that we lived in that is no longer relevant. I, I've never looked at that gender thing either. I've always been surrounded by amazing women who have done, you know, so you just look at this. So when I look back, again, I look out there at my past, it was my mother and my aunties in the thing that in the Māori village that actually made the difference. And if you want to look at gender and where we take our models from, look to Māori, and you get it perfectly. Men like me, we just walked around did all the talking. The aunties made things happen. And <laughs> if you look at if you look at the land marches that changed this country, they were led by Māori women. So let's not talk about the gender. Let's look to the culture that was here before. And know that give everybody the chance. It's the same. Charles, were you... Well, I, I was just going to answer the first question. No, please do. Yeah, yeah. Age, but I'll, I'll just make an observation in relation to... I mean, if you, you go back a little while or so ago, I mean, financial service was a very attractive environment. In fact, technology is proving to be the environment that is really attracting our talent in today's day and age. My own firm, you know, PwC, might argue, is very focused on that. I'm delighted to say within the UK it's 51% in, in favour uh, female uh, women versus uh, men joining our firm. Can I just come back to the earlier point there around education, age, etc. I do think we, as we look forward, there's a sort of, sort of new paradigm around what leadership looks like, uh, a different form of leadership. And that's got to empower uh, the younger generations in a better, more constructive way. We are certainly seeing that. And part of my programme as a Lord Mayor of the City of London, I'm endeavouring to, to focus out through my trust programme and much more, is empowering a community of leaders of tomorrow, getting that next generation to take a greater sense of leadership. And we're actually going beyond that too. So I have, by way of example, I have a draw together a community of, of the great and good for breakfast in, in the mansion house, which is where I live. Um, and they are really the great and the good of, of British industry. And that's called the city number one breakfast. And we now have a city number two breakfast, which is the next generation leaders. Mm -hmm. And we now, in place, are putting in an, in, in, into place a city number three breakfast, which is the children of the future. Very exciting. Thank you. Um, your question here, why are creative skills not as much of a priority as STEM skills? So if, if, you know, I, I think creative skills are in more demand yeah. now than ever yeah. before and will continue to be. And I think, if, in fact, some people call STEM STEAM and bring the arts and the creativity yeah. and innovation in. I don't think there's any talk about that reducing. In fact, the more human aspects of creativity and innovation and, and collaboration are going to be the skills of the future. STEM, I think, is because it underpins every industry. It's, it's the hygiene test. You know, in the days that we could write longhand, now it's how, you know, how confident are you around digital devices and platforms? Mm. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think STEM and STEAM is incredibly creative. So, you know, engineers are amazingly creative and, and the, some of the technologists and the designers and the graphic artists are, are incredibly creative. And that is such an important skill set for the future that we're heading into is what you do with all of this insight that is being given to you, or that will be handed to you on a plate, and how do you connect that in a creative way to design new products and services? I think science is incredibly creative. I, um, I read a statistic, some, I mean, 90% of statistics are made up, right? But <laughs> I, uh, I read a statistic somewhere that it's something like 60, 65% of all coders uh, speak a second language and play a musical a instrument yeah. or something. So creativity, the two things go hand in hand. Yeah. I remember Jeff Weibel, who was the professor that trained the people that we took from the university, and whenever he was asked, what do I need to do to get my kids into programming? He said, take another language and learn music. Yeah. yeah. And that was 28, 30 years ago. Yeah. And yet our current New Zealand curriculum, uh, I'm speaking parochially here uh, <laughs> in front of foreigners, um, it doesn't um, incorporate um, either of those mm. uh, as a requirement. So are you strongly advocating absolutely another language um, and absolutely I, I uh, music? I'm surrounded by these people, you know, and creativity just oozes out of them, whether they're writing code, whether they're solving problems, whether they're creating new 
um, applications that go to the world creativity mm. is at the core of it all. Mm. One last question. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that actually as those um, people are coming through into our workplaces, it's really going to challenge a lot of us who are leading some of those workplaces. And I think um, getting younger people alongside uh, leadership teams is actually something that's going to make a big difference. But I think the world is changing. Uh, for many of the people in this room, the way in which we've run organisations, that's changing. And the sooner we learn how to lead and manage in those kinds of environments, the better. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I'm really passionate about is how do we get youth into our boardrooms in terms of governance? So a lot of the yep. um, governance, you have to have a certain level of experience. Well, well, why don't we start evolving our governance model? So yes, there are areas where there is risk around the business that you just absolutely have to have experience in managing. But that's not digital and that's not technology. So carve out the products and services, the creation of, of um, new technologies, et cetera, et cetera, and get young people in governing those aspects of your business. And then the areas, you know, health and safety and the, the, the areas where you do need a really strong level of experience, then yes, call that. And together, you've got a beautiful blend coming together. But, you know, young people can look at those risks and solve them in a totally different way yeah, than you thought of, right? True. I have no qualms about having young people on a board and dealing to the problems that we think we know the answers to. Mm. One last question for you all. Uh, we know from our discussion today that there is fabulous opportunity for everyone in this if we get a whole bunch mm. of things right. So what's the most direct thing you say, the most compelling thing you say to anybody you run into who fears there is not a job for them, there is not a future for them, um, this, they're going to be run over by this. W w what's your single most powerful message? So if I'll start that, everyone is responsible for their own g gaining new knowledge. You can't, you can't transfer that further to somebody else. It's your own responsibility. We've never had more access to information and, inf and, and education online. There is absolutely no excuse. So I think that we've got to take, take hold of that responsibility and step forward with it. But, and I think that actually unless governments get up and do this job properly, people will get run over, people mm. will get left behind, and currently I don't see anything there that's addressing it. I love this idea. I always th thought that Stephen Jobs didn't know it, but he designed the iPad and the iPhone for Māori and Pacifica kids <laughs> because we don't use pencils. We tutu with our hands. And when you watch kids using these things, they are really magical, their storytelling. And our government has, governments have got to get up and give them the tools or they will get run over. I really can't add anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, just two things from me. I think um, you won't get left behind if you've got an attitude of lifelong learning. Like, yeah. and, and especially kids coming through today, 90, 95 years they're going to be living to. Um, so being willing to constantly learn, and to Ian's point, but just um, maybe a slightly different perspective on that, I, I don't know that governments are the best place to solve some yeah, of these challenges, right. yeah. but I do think social enterprise is a beautiful spot because it's not about making profit um, out of vulnerable. It's about um, people who are innovative, creative, entrepreneurial, and applying those skills to social causes, and that's where I think we can bring more of society with us through the next decade. Could I just say that that's where this big $40 billion Māori economic engine that's got bigger that's where you need to be stepping up. We talk about social return on investment. Yep. Māori do it all the time. It's time to st actually step up and start doing something about it with our own people. Mm. I think in terms, I'm much more optimistic about how jobs are looking in the future. I think it is a bit, as was said by one of the speakers earlier today, it's tasks of jobs. I think the focus of jobs will change. And I think any one of us in um, the room here could think about when we started work and some jobs that used to be part of the workplace um, have gone and other jobs have emerged. So I'm much more optimistic about that. And uh, linking that with lifelong learning, I think, is the way in which um, society will move forward. And I do worry about some parts of the community who don't have the access to the tools to do the lifelong learning at the moment. But um, you know, I'm hopeful of that as well. Charles, you've Rose. come a long way for the last word. <laughs> a long way for the last word. Well, from a City of London perspective, the future is bright. We've been around for 800 years, as I said, said earlier, and we've been constantly involving, evolving ourselves, constantly, constantly reinventing ourselves over that course of time, using and basing it on strong fundamentals. Um, and I say, the future is bright. But that's based on the fact that, you know, those three points I made earlier, education, 
government support, strong regulatory framework. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for our panel, please. Uh, bear with us just for a moment. Uh, uh, we're going to do, a, a, Rosalie and I are going to do a very quick sum up um, and um, well, then we'll let you go. Uh, we'll let you all go. Uh, Rosalie. Well, where I wanted to start was, uh, first of all, um, hands up those of you who think that the most digitally advanced nation is New Zealand. Rosalie. Yeah, that pretty much reflects the poll. Um, we had um, Estonia. I gave the result already. Oh, you've given the result. Oh. That must have been one of those moments where I wasn't concentrating. Apologies on that. Right. End of the day. Look, we have had an incredible day, and I actually have to say that this panel has really summed up so much of what we've heard. If you think back to the morning sessions, we had Minister Curran, who was really just laying out the attitude and the approach that the government wants to take, very much around that of building trust, reducing divide, and how do they collaborate much better? And that's been a real theme that has worked right the way across the day. How do we collaborate better? I would argue that we also need to better understand what that collaboration means, because it needs to be out of a command and control environment, or one of where it's about relationships, to one of where we actually actively work together for the common good. Um, Graham Codrington, he had a, a fascinating framework where he talked about the tides, the technology, particularly mobile, one hand, three clicks, institutional chains, with the way that blockchain was going to really unlock algorithms, machine learning, and fundamentally change and sort of move the empowerment from centralised places down to individuals. The demographics, this point of our age and how long we will live, and also the environment with that really powerful vision that actually energy could become free. Um, Seam Sickert has obviously done a very good job with Estonia featuring so highly as a digitally empowered nation. Um, but I think it also showed uh, the way in which a government can change its mindset, its practices, and become genuinely innovative. And the thing that really came out for me that I'm personally going to take away back to Callaghan Innovation, I think, um, is that you know if someone comes to them with an idea, if it's not bold enough, if it's not really moving forward and technological enough, it won't get the funding. That was the stick part of it. And I thought, wow, how often do you hear that kind of attitude um, within, within government? This afternoon, we've had um, a number of the workshops and the panel sessions, and there's been a lot of insight that's come out of that. Very little discussion about technology. As we know, being a digital nation is actually less about the technology and the tools, and so much more about the leadership, the mindset, and the capability. But I think so much of that has been wrapped up this afternoon, which is basically saying that new mindset, those new tools and approaches for leadership are about how do we distribute and allow decision-making to be held much more at the coalface. How do we empower our customers, our people, um, so much more, and just get out of the way um, for where a lot of the technology is taking us? And then how do we embrace the changes that are coming by being lifelong learners ourselves? So these are some of the ideas that it's worth, all of you will have something that you take away with you that you really want to carry through into the sessions tomorrow where you really begin to look at what is it going to look like for New Zealand in 2030.